Okay, so I'd like to start by thanking Vito and the, the team of the project for having invited me to come here. It's the third time I come to this seminar. I came to the second one, 2010. I came to the sixth, which was in Lisbon, September 2015. So this is my third participation, and I always enjoy very much coming. So I always thank you very much for inviting me. So the topic I'll be the, what the topic of my talk. When you asked me to come to this seminar, I knew it was connected to the project. So I was trying to think of something which could be relevant to the project. Um, I had the first idea which we then decided to, which was perhaps too peripheral, which was this debate between Tashera Pushkwaza and Antonio Sanchez. So I switched to the Cambridge tradition. And the point of uh, switching to the Cambridge tradition, I have two purposes with the presentation. One is that when we are trying to understand what type of economics came to Portugal, became dominant, which is what you are addressing in this project. I remember a book by uh, Professor Jacinto Nunes where he mentions, identifies the work of Tashana Ivan in Quimbrand, Pintor Bosnia in Lisbon, as being two main driving factors of bringing Robin's approach to economics to Portugal. So I thought it would be perhaps interesting to understand which was the approach that was dominant before Robin's, and how it changed due to the contributions of the LEC. Of course, to get to Portugal, we still have to study the whole process of it going to the US, the demise of institutionalism, but that's too much for a talk, so I will focus on the Cambridge tradition. Another reason I thought it could be interesting is because it was very clearly a case of an approach which was an intellectual, intellectual center, and it is an approach which became actually intellectual periphery at some point, for reasons I will explain. So, these are the reasons for addressing this topic, which is the one I'll be talking about today. Before going into the topic in more detail, I perhaps have to explain a bit more, a bit of the ideas that were, of the ideas that were dominant in Cambridge at the time at a more philosophical level, so that we can understand the underlying methodological and philosophical presuppositions of the, the whole approach. So I will be centered on Alfred Marshall. There is an argument of the relative influence of Ernst Seelig and so on, but I will focus on Marshall. And one idea which was very important for the definition of the Marshallian economics was one idea that was very discussed in philosophical centers in Cambridge at the time, which was the idea of internal relations, which it means a relation in which something is constituted by the relation in which it stands to something else. I remember discussing with John this topic, because the, the, the point, the overall philosophy of internal relations argues that every entity we can observe is related to something else. It doesn't mean that all relations are internal. It doesn't mean that this phone is related to everything else. It just means that it is related to something else. And for Marshall, this posed a problem. Uh, for, actually, the problem is posed by Bertrand Russell in a perhaps clearer way, because he discusses, discusses the problem explicitly. He says, if everything is related to something else, I can never get exact knowledge by looking at a part of reality. And so, so that's what Russell writes in his History of Western Philosophy, and he says, therefore, Hegelianism, and this idea that everything is related, must be rejected, otherwise I cannot have an exact knowledge of everything. Then he goes to logical category, but that's a story in analytical philosophy. Marshall was also facing the same problem, but he thought he could address it through differential calculus. He, 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 took, he explains this in more detail in Industry and Trade, and he says that, you can focus on the one hand on direct effects of x on y, but there are also indirect effects of x on z and through z on y. But if changes are infinitesimally small, you can neglect because there will be a second order of small. So this is this technical argument that Marshall says. The outcome was that you could focus on a partial, or as he called it, a particular equilibrium, while neglecting for other things, which remain satanic values. And how do you take account of other things? you take into account, not through a model, but through language. So, uh, you, you take into account, not in a formal model, but informally. I think you have a paper in this called his like his book of fact and fiction, where you mentioned this distinction between formal and informal parts of the model. And Mary Morgan also has a paper of that issue, uh, of that book. So, um, the, the idea, this is pretty much the general idea. This is also part, and uh, the whole Cambridge approach was in Marshall, in G. Moore, in Keynes, was all their influence by this organic view of the world, 
which in Marshall appears in a clear way when he discusses evolutionary approaches as a way of understanding the economy, understanding the economy in Spencerian terms of differentiation and integration as an organic whole. And that captures part of Marshall that Professor Beckhoff was addressing when he was saying that many of the things he says that do not fit into neoclassical economics. Because when the term neoclassical was coined by Werner, by neo, he meant new evolutionary insights that will be combined with the classical outlook that Marshall was claiming to be continuing. Where he makes reference to Smith, Ricardo, and also Mill in the book. He makes reference to three, even though tends to refer more to Ricardo than Mill, as Professor Beckles was saying. So, this is pretty much the overall approach to partial equilibrium. <coughs> it's an approach where mathematics in Marshall is left to appendixes, and the idea is that through ordinary language, you can capture much of the organic part of reality. This is something that Keynes will also emphasize. In the general theory, I think it's pages 297 to 298, he has a very famous passage where he says that when we're using words, we can keep at the back of our heads the necessary qualifications, whereas when we use what he calls symbolic pseudo-mathematics, because the claims is not real mathematics, that's another story, you cannot keep all the qualifications at the back of your head. There is an interesting letter by John Hicks where he's talking with people and he's saying, well, you see, uh, there are many things that you are not putting there. You are just, and people says, I cannot put them in the model because I want to um, take them, all the variables into account and I can do better with words. And then John Hicks goes saying, well, that means he's really a general equilibrium theorist because he wants to take everything into account and just didn't put it in the model, just thinking in terms of words. But the very important part was this use of words. Now, why is this use of words important? Actually, it also, that's part of the reason why, as Professor Beckhaus was saying, you had to go to Cambridge to understand all the, the, the details, because many things are in words and are, are not expressed in the, in the mathematics. It also contributes for Cambridge became in some, in some, in some aspects, quite a hermetic tradition in some, in some respects. I remember when I first heard, when I was talking to my PhD supervisor, Tony Lawson used to say, at Oxford they think they are at the center of the world. In Cambridge, they think they are the world. Because it's the idea that there is not, it's uh, the idea that everything must be understood in the context. So, um, and it's an idea that it's in Jean Moore, then in Wittgenstein, and this conversation with Schraff, and so on. So, but that's the point. There is this logical part of language, Summary, so, so far what I wanted to say is that there is this logical part of language which is easily transmitted across and can be international transmitted and then there is this semantic dimension of language of words that must be captured in context. The first part is what Wittgenstein was addressing in Tractatus and the second part is what he was addressing in the philosophical investigations of course. Now, what happens with this approach is that when you, we, you come to discuss welfare economics and you refer to terms as utility you are using, you are referring to utility and well-being in more descriptive terms. So Marshall could, be, could do things like distinguish between more uh, objective needs versus more uh, less important desires and could have this descriptive approach to human well-being where normative implications would always be connected to the analysis. Because if the analysis is conducted in words, words also have a semantic charge with them which implies values as this for the early seminars on on the, uh, one of the, the second seminar was on facts and values, right? That you went into the group, facts, values, and objectivity in economics. So if you are using words, values are always attached. Whereas if you do just math, there are values there as well, epistemic values, but they don't come across as easily. Now what happens subsequently, of course, is that at some point, Pigou was using this Marshallian approach to make the following argument. Was, you would argue that if you have redistribution of income from those who have a higher, who have less income to those who have, uh, sorry, from those who have more income to those who have less income, you increase overall utility. Because people who have lower income have a higher marginal utility for the same income. So redistribution will bring a higher level of utility. This argument, it comes in chapter, it's explain in more detail in chapter 8 of the first part of uh, Economics of Welfare, People's 1920 book. And there he also says something else, which is the idea that if you give income to people who have less income, they also have a higher propensity to consume. He doesn't say this in these words, 
but that's the same thing that Keynes will say later and put at the center of his own social philosophy. But it was in Pico, who he was criticizing so much in the general theory. And this argument could not be made subsequently for, by those who accepted Levinal Robbins' claims that there cannot be there cannot be no interpersonal comparisons of utility. So the idea of Robbins was at the LSC that there can be no interpersonal comparisons of utility will undermine this possibility of arguing for a redistribution of equal income in a more egalitarian direction. And uh, what happens here is that Robbins will take subjective states to be, sorry, will mean utility to mean, to mean only a subjective state which cannot be further scrutinized, so it's taken as exogenous data. This was being taken also by the early Hayek, even though Hayek developed a more sophisticated theory of how we find knowledge in society, but it was also taken in the same way. And this Robbins and Hayek approach would defend free trade more on the grounds of the liberty it provides, rather than in the welfare it brings to society. That other argument would be made by the people who were developing general equilibrium theory at the LSE. So, uh, John X claims, uh, I think it's in his book, Value and Capital, he writes that for, at the time that most people in England were reading Marshall's Principles, he was, re he was more influenced by Pareto's 1906-1907 book, The uh, Mandel. So, uh, he was more influenced by Pareto than by Marshall. And they were developing this approach to general equilibrium theory with X and then Calder having these compensation schemes that would allow the use of the Pareto criterion in economics. And so from this moment onwards you have something which is a separation of efficiency and equity. So economists, according as, as, as positive science should address the as positive science should address efficiency, but equity is separated. Now, one reason why this happens is because the whole, the overall economy, whereas the Marshallian method was to focus on a given partial equilibrium, but you will leave something out to be explained with words. And in fact, even Marshall mathematics was different because it was much based on geometry. It had to do with the training that they had, that he had through the Cambridge Mathematical Treatise, which was very Newtonian oriented, so more focused on geometrical and mechanical examples, concrete examples rather than the continental symbolic mathematics which were which had a different nature. This is something I talked to when I was here in one of these previous seminars, but I will talk again. But uh, it had to do with that. But it had to do specifically with this idea of Marshall that mathematics would put the left to appendixes and so you could use words as much as you can. It would bring a normative charge. Whereas the other approach would be much more uh, the approach that would emerge subsequently was much more analytical, mathematical. And what happens here is that when you get this approach to general equilibrium, you start to get into the idea that everything must be explained in mathematical form. Now, mathematics is something, as has been said in the first presentation, that helps disseminating things across various countries because Whereas, if you want to understand something in context, you have to go to the place and understand the overall culture, the overall set of beliefs, values, and so on. With mathematics, you can objectively pick a mathematical model and, transfer and bring it somewhere else, and it's, more, and it's easier to transmit the overall idea of the mathematical structure. But this emphasis on mathematical structures will also mean that um, in economics, you um, start to spend more time looking at the mathematical structure of the model rather than the underlying structure of reality. So that's the, the point that starts to happen. So very briefly, what I was been trying to argue so far is that the Cambridge tradition had this organic approach where the organic whole was trying to be taken into account through the use of words together with the mathematical method, but focusing on words to play most of it, to play most part. This enabled the use of normative concepts, and this enabled to take uncertainty into account in the sense that, as Keynes would say, you can, using words, you can keep all these things at the back of your head, whereas if you want to demand exact knowledge, you cannot be using words. But the problem is that in economics, since we don't have 
the possibility of reaching, if you see that it's an organic hole and you cannot reach it that college, you will not be able to reach it anywhere through the mathematical structure. So what happens subsequently, of course, is that this welfare economics, this Pigovian welfare economics, is replaced by what is called at the time new welfare economics, which is this Peritian approach of X Calder. Both X and Calder changed their mind. Calder earlier than X, so Calder, of course, went to Cambridge and became pretty much a Keynesian. John X also in the 70s also writes papers claiming that, uh, let's say I'm not John X, who is very disrespectful to JRX, his neoclassical uncle. So I'm a non neoclassical economist, John X, who is very disrespectful to my uncle JRX, who was a neoclassical economist. So um, they changed their minds, both of them changed their mind, of course. But from these two approaches at the LAC, so the one more focusing on general equilibrium, and the one focused on the more descriptive approach to liberty, the Robbins Hayek, of course, the one that starts to become dominant is the general equilibrium approach. It's X changes it to a new notion of time where you focus on intertemporal equilibrium. Then when it goes to the US, um, Harold de Brown and Mackenzie bring this fixed point theorem, which John Nash had just applied to game theory. And they reformulate the mathematics of the general equilibrium theory using that different type of mathematics. But uh, what happens uh, subsequently, is John, as John was saying, is that the problem then will, uh, will become fragmented. But um, I think this whole story shows the power of institutions, as John was saying that the IMT remains powerful regardless of what is being done in, in there. I think that the movement of Frank Hahn to Cambridge at some point was at the LSC developed this approach is of course an, a, a, very influ a very influential moment for the, the change of the approach. But uh, th this approach did not completely disappear. I mean, there were people like James Mead, Tony Atkinson and even Amartya Sen who still wanted to have an approach to human well-being that would be able to engage in more normative considerations, especially Sam did so. The capability approach is developed as a, initially as a way to, to move to a more objective informational basis because the problem identified by Robbins is that utility is too much of a subjective measure. So it's too subjective, you cannot compare it to these of different people. So Sam's move at some point is to move to a more objective thing, such as capabilities. Because then you can have a more objective basis for engaging in comparisons of, um, of utility. But still, I, well, all this, even despite the influence of Atkinson on Piketty or the influence of Sam on the human development approach and so much, I don't think these approaches can claim to be anything mainstream compared to what we see in, in the economics department, even Sam himself says he's not mainstream, I mean he says he, he complains his ideas are not uh, well accepted in microeconomics departments, even though if you have a Nobel Award and you complain you are not very heard, heard of, I mean, it doesn't mean you are completely ignored, you have a Nobel Award, but, but I understand the point. So, uh, but from this story, what, I, what do I think that this story can help understanding the case here in Portugal? I think the first, I think it can help in two ways, which I already said in the beginning, but perhaps it's clear, it can be made clear now after telling the story. I think that it can help in two ways. The first way is to understand exactly what you mean by the type of neoclassical economics or Robbins approach to scarcity that became dominant. I think if we see that the economists that were coming to do their PhD in the US and coming back to Portugal were importing some sort of neoclassical or mainstream approach, we have to understand clearly how the approach was shaped and I think the tension between three things, the Marshallian approach, the LSC approach and institutionalism in the US, the tension between these three things will generate different types of approaches in the US and by looking at where did each Portuguese economist go to do their PhD, you can understand what type of influence they will have. Of course there are cases like for example Milton Friedman in Chicago claiming to be a Marshall I mean, we don't, we're not sure to what, extent, to what extent he was really reading Marshall that carefully and just wanted to differentiate himself from the Valoresians. But I think that if you look at the Valoresian dash Paretian approach, the Marshallian dash Pigovian approach, and institutionalism, you see that 
in the, and that's the part where, which I still haven't studied and would like to study in more detail in the future. To what extent are Harvard, MIT on one hand, Chicago, uh, influenced by each of these types of approach? We know that Chicago at some point became more Barrezian, then less Barrezian, then at some point it switched to a, even Hayek and the public choice approach had some influence there at some point. So I think that to understand what type of economic field we come to Portugal, the, the process of institutionalization that Vitor was addressing is very important, of course, but we need also to understand the content. What is it that was being important? And for that, we need to understand the story a bit better. Starting, and I think, well, we can go all the way back to the Bay, but uh, perhaps Marshall, LSC, institutional are good places to start to see the mix that was being formed in the 20th century and how it influenced, um, how it influenced uh, Portugal. The second part, why I think this story is also relevant and might have some importance, it's this distinction between approaches which are more fully mathematized and can be more easily transmitted across cultures and approaches which are not, which are the interpretation of which is very context dependent. And I think the Cambridge approach is an interesting example because of course the German historical school and other institutions are also very context dependent. Um, I, re I remember Milton Friedman complaining that he went to Colombia and he thought, thought Colombia is even more romantic than Cambridge. I mean, this is, the institutionalism of Colombia was, he thought that it was so close to everything that existed outside. But I think that Cambridge is a good example of an approach which was very influential at the time, but it was also the interpretation of the approach dependent a lot on contextual aspects that have to be understood with words and so it's interesting to see it's perhaps how such an even and such an approach when it's dominant can become very vulnerable to other approaches which are not the interpretation of which is not so context dependent i think part of the reason why what we call today mainstream economics became so dominant is because it's very easy to transmit mathematical ideas across countries in a way in a way that other type of ideas which depend on context are not. And that has implications for the way in which we understand economics, political economy, and human well-being. Because by the time you are focusing on mathematics, you are focusing on the mathematical structure of the model, and subjective states enter as data, which cannot be further scrutinized. And that's part some steps away from an approach where you can use words with their inevitable semantics, and by doing that, ethics is still mixed with economics in some way, as Amartya Sen has also claimed that it should be. And so perhaps I said there were two aspects which were important, which was the type of economics that came to Portugal, the case study of something, of an approach which was very context dependent and how it becomes vulnerable to something which can be more easily transmitted, but perhaps a third aspect that could also be considered, and actually it was at the topic of the paper because it was the social philosophy, is how economics, and I think the movement from the Cambridge tradition to the LEC approach signals a moment in the Anglo-Saxon world, or at least the British world, where the moment where ethics and moral considerations start to be considered to be outside the scope of economics. And that's also a very significant change, especially given the influence that economists have in political and uh, policy circles, given that policy measures and the policy making should also is in inevitably connected to, um, to moral values. And that has to do with the emergence of the role of the economist, which I think Peter talked in one of the seminars and the idea of technocracy that John was saying now. So I think that's another. So I was trying to tell this story while also making it relevant to the project, and I hope to have made it relevant to the project in these first two dimensions, and perhaps the third one, which can be further discussed. Thank you.